He sends his pure, sweet love, a sign from above. Sign from above. On the wings of the dove. Do not exaggerate in the slightest degree when I say that what we're about to think upon is worth a king's ransom and much, much more. That which has been most attractive to people in 2,000 years has been the gospel as found in the parables of Christ. These stories constitute one-third of the verbal teaching of our Lord. And whether old or young, whether learned or unlearned, these stories have always occupied the supreme place in the hearts of the readers of the Gospels. It's these treasures we're going to look at today. Think of every parable as a glorious casket with magnificent gems inside. Think of a basket of peaches, how attractive they look, but much, much more succulent to the taste than pleasing to the eye. And the deeper we get into these stories, the richer we'll find them to be, the sweeter. They tell us about God. They tell us about our own hearts. They tell us about life. They tell us about pain and pleasure. They tell us about success and failure. These stories tell us how to live for time and for eternity. We'll find the cross is mirrored in these stories. The cross was about the goodness of God and his holiness. Both his love and his justice were exhibited at the cross. And these are the themes, the superb themes of Christ's great stories. We're going to begin with the ones first recorded in Matthew's Gospel in the 13th chapter, beginning with the story of the sower. I'm reading to you from Matthew 13, right at the commencement. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. This, of course, is not the Mediterranean Sea, but it's the Sea of Galilee, 16 miles one way and 6 miles another. Great crowds gathered about him, so he got into a boat and sat there, and the whole crowd stood on the beach. He told them many things in parables, and what Matthew will record is seven of them. And the stories are both practical and prophetic. The stories, in one sense, cover 2,000 years of future history, beginning with the coming of Christ, the sower who went out from heaven to earth to sow, and finishing when the angels come forth to sever the wicked from among the just at the end of the world. So these seven stories cover the whole of the Christian era. They're practical as well as prophetic, and they tell us some things about our own hearts, that can change our lives and alter our destinies. I'm reading now from the end of verse 3. A sower went out to sow. Christ himself is the sower. And indeed the seed is Christ. The gospel of Christ is what causes men to be born again. This is what he came from heaven to spread along the highways and the byways of earth. So Christ himself is the sower that went forth from heaven to sow his seed, the truth about himself. The scriptures call the word of God, that's also a title for Jesus. You read in the book of Revelation that he came forth who had on his thigh a name written, the word of God. Christ is the living word. This is the written word. The seed that causes us to be born again is the gospel word about Jesus. The great thing about this story that I like so much is it's very realistic. Some optimists are not realists. Christ was both an optimist and a realist. And the great thing in this story is he's saying to his followers that as you spread the word, don't think that everybody's going to jump at it. Don't expect that all the crowds will rise up and cheer. The trumpets will be blown, the red carpet will be laid out, and that success is inevitable. In this story of the sower, our Lord is saying, I warn you, most people won't get it. Most people won't see it. For most people, your sowing will be in vain. Fancy starting off with bad news like that. He does it because he's warning us ahead. So to do what he did and to follow in his ways 
is going to take more gumption, more courage, more persistence than any worldly enterprise. He's saying most people will not accept what you say. He is saying that even some who appear to accept it, it'll only be superficial. It'll only be for starters, not for keepers. So let's look at it. It's a story, of course, not of just the sower, but of the soils, the four soils. And only one out of the four is described as good soil. Of course, he tells the story in the hope that people's hearts responding to the warning may be changed into good soil. I'm reading now from the fourth verse. As he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they had not much soil. Immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. When the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell upon thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil, and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But Christ is telling us that most people won't have ears to hear. He's saying that one out of the four soils will bring forth a bountiful harvest, only one. The first soil is described as being hard pathways. As the sower sows in the field, some of it goes on the pathway. The birds quickly lunge downwards, swallow up the grain. No harvest there. What does he mean by the pathway? He's talking about a heart that's been hardened by much commerce with the world. Whatever gets our attention gets us. One of the supreme lessons in living is to guard well the avenues of the heart. Everything we see, everything we hear, everything we read, Everything we participate in doing has some impact on us. Every one of us is the product of all we've experienced. And it's our choices that are supremely important. What we choose to hear, what we choose to see, what we choose to do either softens or hardens the heart, the mind, the soul, the spirit. I am what I am because I've been doing what I've been doing. There is a sense in which every day is judgment day. And when the God of heaven comes to me with truth, a great deal depends on what I have been doing with truth in the earlier moments of life. So here Christ says, as you sow the gospel, some people's hearts are so hard, they have been ruined by exposure to the lusts of the world, the covetousness of the world, the cruelty of the world. It's a tough world out there. Unless one is allied with God, it's hard to resist being hardened by it. Most people have been hardened. So Christ says, don't expect every hearer will jump and rejoice and say, I see it. Some are so hardened, it won't even be noticed. He explained it further himself, as recorded in verse 18. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. When anyone hears and doesn't understand it, the evil one takes it away. John Bunyan had a cute saying. He said the clean foods were those where animals chewed the cud and parted the hoof. He said the chewing of the cud is meditation. It's not enough to take the word of God and swallow it down. Said Bunyan, you've got to meditate like those sheep, those cows that chew the cud. A cow munches and munches, regurgitates, has more than one stomach, so it can go over the food and over the food, over the food. Bunyan says, those that chew the cud part the hoof. Those that meditate on the word till they come to understand it, make changes in the way they move, they part the hoof. They choose to go in a right direction rather than a wrong one, provided they meditate. So our Lord, when he explains the first soil, warns us, don't listen casually, because to him that hath shall be given, and from him that hath not shall be taken away. 
even that which they think they have. Tremendously important. What happens to me depends mainly on me. I'm a mirror of life. I reflect according to what I am. And if I'm hardened, everything that comes to me will seem hard. If I'm cruel, everything that comes to me will seem cruel. If I'm kind and loving, the things that come to me will be kind and loving in their impact upon me. Then he talks about soil that's rocky. That doesn't mean soil with stones in it here and there. It means soil that is just superficial with great rock slabs underneath. So there's only a tiny spreading of soil. And the sun beating down on that hard rock underneath is so warm that the soil yields an immediate growth, but it has no root. And as the sun continues to beat, that growing plant withers and dies. And Christ explains this too. And again, I read to you from later in the same chapter. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is verse 20 of Matthew 13, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. Emotional hearers. Too many people live by their feelings. Feelings are God-given. Woe to the person that has none. But woe doubly so to the person whose life is controlled by feelings. Because feelings is like the weather. They come and go. They're not permanent. Thomas Aquinas said, if you're depressed, regard not your feelings. Whatever they are now, they'll shortly be another thing. That's very good advice. Jesus is saying that emotional hearers, people who are used to sudden enthusiasms which don't endure, will see in the gospel another cause for excitement. And most people are bored stiff with life. They want something that will make their feelings effervesce. Christ is saying many people will seize on the gospel as an excuse for temporary joy. But when the realities hit, when they begin to count the cost, when they're persecuted because they've taken a stand that's not popular, when they're tested and tried by the evil one, the people that have no root, the people that haven't learned to live by principle rather than feeling, they'll throw it all in, they'll give it up. So that's the second soil. What about the third one? He tells us about that too. This was the thorny soil. And I'll read to you again from verse 22. As for what was sown among thorns, this is he who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the delight in riches, and one of the other gospels says, and the pleasures of this world, choke the word and it proves unfruitful. The trouble here is that the soil has not been properly farmed. The thorns are still there. They're going to choke the new seed. And Jesus is telling me that the world has many pressures and many pleasures and many distractions. And unless these are dealt with, the word's not going to grow in me. I'm not going to really take hold of the gospel. It won't shape me and make me and remake me. The cares of this world, the attrition, that which depresses the soul. The pleasures of this world, that which elevates us, attracts us, makes us buoyant. And wealth. You can't live without some degree of wealth. Someone has said that without it, meaning things, you can't live. But he who lives for things alone is not a man. We need things. Some possessions we must have. But if they possess us, we're in deep trouble. So our Lord is now warning us, when the gospel comes into the life, whether it will survive depends on our attitude to life's trials and life's temptations. The cares, the pleasures, the enticement of mammon, these are the things that can quickly stifle and kill any burgeoning interest 
in the gospel. And none of us are without cares. And there are none of us impervious to the offerings of pleasure because God's the author of pleasure. The devil never invented a pleasure in his life. But what the devil does is take something that is permitted by God and exaggerate it beyond its legal and right place. Even care is a good thing. It throws us upon God. If we had no cares, we'd never be dependent. I think we could live by our own wisdom, our own strength. Even care is a good thing, but too much care is suicide. Pleasure. You can't live without joy, without laughter. But too much pleasure and not enough duty is like the crackling of thorns under a pot, according to the wise man in Proverbs. So Jesus here is saying, be careful. What things you allow to weigh upon you, control your will, direct your interests. Be careful what you do about life's anxieties and its enticements. Be wary. Finally, he talks about the good soil. And by the good soil, he's not suggesting that some people's hearts are naturally good. What he's saying is that sinners fall into two categories. Some who are always justifying themselves, who are self-excusers, and others who acknowledge the real distinction between right and wrong and make no boasts of where they are. Zacchaeus is in the second group. The woman who was a sinner that anointed Christ's feet was in the second group. Pharisees are in the first group. So by good soil, he's not saying people who are intuitively uh, spiritual. He's just rather saying some people are more honest. They have learned some things from the discipline of life and they see the folly of boasting beyond their attainments. And he's saying, for those people, I can give help. I can give them joy. The gospel seed will blossom, multiply, bring forth a wonderful harvest. So, behold the significance of this first story told by Jesus. It's a warning to all Christians. Don't think the world's going to tumble over itself in joyous gladness because of the message you're bringing. As Jesus pictures it, three out of four. I'm sure it's not meant to be mathematically construed, but he's saying the majority will not eagerly accept the gospel. Then he went on and told another story which increases the bad news. He next tells a story about tares, weeds. Verse 24, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the householder came and said to him, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? How then has it weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said, Do you want us to go and gather them out? He said, No, lest in gathering out the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I'll tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. What's he saying? He's saying not only are there external problems when the gospel is proclaimed, cares of this world, the hardened heart, pleasures, temptations, trials and troubles, but they're going to be inward troubles in the church. I remember I hadn't been teaching very long at Avondale College when uh, a student came to me who was probably the best student I ever had. And he was very depressed because he was a new Christian and he expected that Avondale, a Christian college, would be a place of saints. And he had found indeed that the people there were very human, the same sort of weaknesses he had or had had. And he came to me troubled about it. This is the experience of many new Christians. Jesus in this story is saying, don't make the mistake of thinking that when you are in the field of the church, it's all wheat, it's all healthy, it's all glorious, it's all bright, it's all truthful, it's all loving, it's all compassionate. No, says Jesus, even in the church there's going to be a mixture. The tares were a bastardized wheat. You can only tell the difference 
when the corn, the grain, appeared in the ear. And so our Lord is saying, you'll meet with disappointments in the church, but don't judge too quickly, because you may be wrong. You can only really tell by the fruit of the life, not by appearances. And don't anticipate the last judgment and think you can go through the church with a reaping hook. Now we have to be careful here because one of the marks of the true church is that it does exert a holy discipline. Calvin said long ago, the marks of the true church are three. One, the preaching of the true gospel. Two, the carrying out of the ordinances that symbolize that gospel, the Lord's Supper, baptism. And three, holy discipline, by which he meant the church should not tolerate those who engage in flagrant, public, open sin. They're the marks of the true church. Preaching the gospel, practicing the ordinances that prefigure the gospel, baptism, the Lord's Supper, and a holy discipline. The non-toleration of flagrant, open violation of the commandments of the Decalogue. Beyond that, we cannot go. The Lord has so many admonitions. Judge not that you be not judged. With what judgment you judge, it will be measured to you again. But he also says, by their fruits you shall know them. So this story is saying that even when the gospel appears to have success and brings forth a company of believers, that company will be a mixed company. There will be imitation Christians with the true ones. Our Lord is telling to us, don't anticipate the final judgment. In the early centuries, there was a group known as the Donatists. And they protested about the irregularities and the impurities in the church. And they were very schismatic. And I guess that's why the Christian church has over 600 denominations. And this is in both sides of the camp. Catholics have many divisions too, almost as many as Protestants. And the Donatists were trying to be more holy than they are, but they had their own problems. There is no way of solving this problem in today that we face a mixed church with imitation Christians with the true ones. Ours not to judge, ours not to try and separate unless there's flagrant sin. Rather, we must have the patience of Christ and strive to be so prayerful, so careful in our own lives that we might set an example that others are safe to follow. That's where we'll stop this portion of our study of the parables by the Sea of Galilee. We'll continue in our next segment.